There is a lot of mystery around how drives are working inside of the chiller system. And one of the reasons that I think we have this mystery is because when we're working on VFDs or VSDs, AFDs, whatever you want to call them, when we're working on these on, let's say, standard equipment, we've got Dan Foss, ABB, Yaskawa, we've got all these kind of packaged brands that have a fully contained system and we don't have to really do much more than hook up on either end of it in and out give it a control signal and it's going to run we don't troubleshoot beyond that we used to but we don't buy modern standards but when we scale into the the size of systems that we're dealing with with a chiller system We've got a very large drive assembly that has to be serviced and needs to be repaired because the instead of it being, a, say, a couple of thousand dollars to do a 20 horse, 30 horse VFD, now we're spending tens of thousands of dollars on these drive assemblies for these two and 300 horse motors, or that's on the low end. So it is imperative that we have the ability to troubleshoot and service that equipment. Now, how does it work? How does the electricity flow from one end of that drive to the other where it goes from the grid AC current and then somehow converts to some kind of PWM DC on the other side? We're going to go through that. How you doing? I hope you're having a really good day. I'm Holden Schamberger. I'm with HVAC Time and Chiller Academy. My specialty is chiller systems and VFDs is one of the things that I've really prided myself on. We're going to talk about that more today and dive into it. First things first, let's just remove some of the nomenclature out of the way. A VFD or VSD or AFD, it is the same thing. It's all about just variable speed control of whatever motor we're using. So the question becomes, how do we do that? So on the output side of our drives, we've got variable hertz. We may have 30 hertz, 40 hertz, 200 hertz, you know, in some cases. So like what's going on there? Because if we have any kind of basic electricity, we understand that the U.S. grid at minimum operates at 60 hertz and operates at 50 hertz in other regions. So where are we going from that 50 or 60 hertz into these other hertz cycles it comes back to how we're manipulating the that current with the drive i'm going to use just a baseline example for the principal sake here so we're got a 460 volt system and it, we're controlling a 460 volt motor all the way through so we have 460 volts 60 hertz ac coming into the drive assembly the first thing that's going to hit is typically going to be some kind of inline filter a line filter or a line reactor they go by a couple of different terms either way you're going to pass through that filter what that filter's job is is to just kind of smooth out and clean up kind of pre-process almost a little bit of that incoming current and that's largely because the power coming in from the grid isn't necessarily all that clean so what the filter is doing is from end to end there's no actual resistance there its job is to run that that current through a solid core so there's a solid core of steel that it's wrapped around and you know you can mag it it should mag to ground as like a regular wire would but you you measure ohms one end to the other on the terminal and you're going to see zero ohms that's a good line reactor and there should be nothing in between it's not a transformer they very commonly get confused with a transformer because they look so much similar to one just a, in many cases a massive one that's not true line reactors that line reactor is going to clean up that ac sine wave as it comes in it's going to balance everything out as it feeds into our scrs our silicon controlled rectifiers not silicone silicon don't worry i i that tripped me up i said silicone for a really long time before i got corrected myself so just you're not alone there all right you're not alone what the scr is doing is it is rectifying the sine wave and now most of the time we're using a half wave rectification i've gotten feedback on this over time that a lot of newer more fancier drive assemblies are doing much more than this and on a very large scale or on specific applications that may be true the majority of the drives that we are seeing today right now on most equipment from a baseline manufacturer york train carrier daikin perspective 
these are doing a similar process to what I'm saying. When you read the books, this is what they're describing. So we're doing a half wave rectification. So what that means is that, say, the positive side, the top side of the sine wave curve is being removed. So it's a form of DC without it truly being a, a, a pure DC. But that is what our SCRs are accomplishing. They're rectifying part of that sine wave out of it and converting that current from AC to DC. As it passes through the SCR, it's going to go into our DC bus. Our DC bus is going to feed our capacitor bank. So the capacitor bank is a, it's a storage bank. It also helps our voltage scaling because we usually go, let's say that, that 460 volts turns into about 650, 700 volts DC on the DC bus side of things. So the capacitors help us not only store that energy to give a very smooth, clean feed to the inverters or the IGBTs, but they also help filter out that extra bit of the sine wave. So that's where we can filter through and create that pure DC output that we're looking for. Because that's what the IGBTs need or the inverter. So the capacitors are typically just an electrolytic style capacitor. Just the same thing we would use, just much larger and higher rating. You can pull those capacitors out and test microfedge through them just like you would a normal capacitor. The trick there is you have to have a, a meter that's able to read that high of capacitance, which is one reason why I really think you should have a block meter style like this. If you're gonna get into doing these drive diagnostics and you're gonna start really getting into the electronics of things, you need a really good, in my opinion, I like a manual set. I'm not a fan of auto setting. I do find that a lot of normal meters on the market don't scale high enough in the microfarad rating to measure these capacitors that we're using on these chillers. And they'll fail just like any capacitor. You know, most of the time when I when they get to the point of they're that critical, I, heck, I've seen that the housing of it will crack and, and bust open. So that's a pretty dead giveaway. Uh, that there's a failure. A lot of the failures I find through them are typically something to that that to that degree. Only every once in a while will you have one just get weak that it doesn't just completely blow or, or, or fracture the housing in some way. To recap, we've gone from line filter to SCR, from SCR to our DC bus, which also has our capacitors. From the capacitors, we're going to feed that DC into our IGBTs. Your IGBT assembly is your inverter. It is taking that DC and it is converting it to an AC. Now, the way that these do this is through PWM, it's pulse width modulation. Now, we've gotten really good technology nowadays, and so this modulation is far more natural than it was in the earlier versions of this equipment where if you hooked all this up to an oscilloscope, so if you don't know what that is, an oscilloscope allows you to actually see the sine curve and it will graph it for you to where you can literally monitor how that curve and that, that current draw is looking from a frequency and hertz perspective. And in early versions of drives, you would literally see this blocky stair step type of look to the sine wave, where now our ability to control those gates has gotten so good that you really, it looks very much like a fairly pure sine wave, even though it is still a PWM in actual theory. Pulse width, meaning that we're momentarily firing that gate. Now we're talking fractions of a second at this point to make this technology work, but we're very rapidly firing a positive volt DC, and then we're gonna fire a negative DC pulse to get the bottom end of the sine wave and a positive for the top end and a bottom for the negative end. And that's how we're able to create the sine uh, wave itself to simulate that for the motors. And that's also why if you're doing any kind of troubleshooting with the drive on the output side, you need a true RMS meter for your measuring your, uh, your, your current flow. You can measure the input coming into the drive assembly with, with a regular meter that's not true RMS but you're gonna have trouble when you try to start reading the output side and also reading voltage across it too. The, what the true RMS does is it helps provide 
extra filtering so that as that PWM action is happening, you can get a clean feed and actually see what's going on. So if you don't have any of those kind of tools and you're looking to start measuring or working with this type of equipment, I do highly suggest you look into that. Getting a better multimeter that has a really high capacitance scaling. It's also got diode testing. Like we're talking good testing here. We're not just talking regular meter level stuff. You also want to make sure that you're using something with true RMS. You have to have that clean signal for the meter to really be able to be that useful to you. Otherwise, it's going to be so jumbled up. You're not going to actually be able to troubleshoot effectively through it. And we'll do more videos on uh, actually troubleshooting these components like an IGBT or an SCR. These things are coming and I'll show you just how critical it is to have a meter that is able to do diode testing. So diode testing is where you've got the little arrow and a kind of a half plus signal and they're jammed together. That's your diode test. It's very, very important that your meter be capable of that and that you're able to trust that. And you know how to use it. And you know that if you read one way, you get a number, you flip your leads around, read the other way, you get a different number. This is going to be very common practice with a lot of our variable speed technology because it's all using the same type of inverter tech and everything in it. So our ability to read through those components and to get those accurate readings is going to be very important. I'm just very heavily stressing that now. Either way, that is your basic current flow through a VSD or VFD in any kind of a chiller system that you're going to work on that's on the market right now. We're coming through the filter. After the filter, we're going to hit our SCRs, SCRs to DC bus and capacitors. That's going to feed out into our IGBTs and that's going to feed out into our motor directly. Now there are bleed resistors, there are snubbers, there are little filters on the input side of the IGBTs. There are other little small components, but those aren't ne necessarily directly influencing the actual current path of how the current is flowing through the drive to get to the motor. Those are extra components. We'll talk about these components. I, I can explain them more as time goes on. Bleed resistors are very, very critical to make sure that they're functioning properly, especially for the safety aspect. Either way, if you'd like some more training like this, check out chilleracademy.com. I got really good stuff over there, trying to build what I needed as I was coming up as a chiller technician so that I could take steps better, take steps faster. I hope it could help you the same way that I know it would have helped me. With that, MTT, make the time for your family, for your spouse, for your kids. I'll see you around.